This is section 4.2, the mean value theorem, content objective 2, which is to understand and use the mean value theorem. By the time we're done, I'd like you to be able to write the mean value theorem in your own words. The theorem that is the MVT is the fourth of the five theorems that you will need to have memorized for this calculus course. And Rolle's theorem is a special case of this particular theorem. If we look at the hypothesis, it says let y equal f of x be a function that is both continuous on the closed interval and differentiable on the open interval. So it saves those two first criteria that are required by the Rolle's theorem. What we're missing is that the endpoints have to be the same. So that means we're going to draw our function without picking up our pencil and we are going to have no corners, cusps, or vertical tangents. As long as that occurs, then there will be at least one point C in the open interval from A to B such that the slope at C is the same as F of B minus F of A over B minus A. So again, the hypothesis of this theorem is going to require that F be continuous on the closed interval and differentiable on the open interval. As long as that happens, the conclusion of this theorem will deal with the function's slope. So we have two functions that deal with outputs. That's the intermediate value theorem and the extreme value theorem. And we have two functions that deal with slope. That's the Rolle's theorem and now this MVT. So what does this really mean for us? If we consider the function as shown below, we can see that we are drawing the function without picking up our pencil from A to B. So on this closed interval from A to B, we did not pick up our pencil. And because it's differentiable on the open interval, we did not ever have a corner, a cusp, or a vertical tangent. When we do that, we can say that F prime of C, which is the tangent slope, has to equal this difference quotient at least one time in the open interval from A to B. Well, if we look at this difference quotient, notice that it is a y-coordinate minus a y-coordinate over an x-coordinate minus an x-coordinate. We should recognize this as being a slope, and it's a secant slope because I have used two different points on the curve. So if I draw this secant line, notice that the slope of that green line is this expression. What the mean value theorem guarantees for us is that the tangent slope has to be the same as that secant slope at least one time. Now in this particular picture that I've drawn, we can see that we'd get another tangent slope that's the same here and another one here. So we can often get more than one C for which the tangent slope and the secant slope will be the same, but MVT will guarantee us at least one. If we look at example one, it says why does the MVT not apply for this function on the interval? Well, if I draw this function, we can see that it is a V, and we are going from negative 1 to positive 1. We are continuous on the closed interval because I don't have to pick up my pencil, but I'm not differentiable because I have a corner. What the MVT conclusion would tell us is that we have a secant slope by connecting those two points and notice that that secant slope is zero but we never get a tangent slope that equals zero anywhere in here because on the right side of zero my tangent slopes will all be positive one and on the left hand side of zero all of my tangent slopes will be negative one so I never get an F prime that equals zero and the reason I am not guaranteed one is because this is not differentiable on the close. So the MVT does not apply because f of x is not differentiable on that entire open interval. With example 2, we're interested in this greatest integer function. So if I draw my greatest integer function, remember that at the integer values we spit out a y-coordinate that's the same as the input. But anywhere in between those integer values, we are stomped down to the integer below. So we end up getting this step function that we've seen in probably Algebra 2 and our pre-calculus classes. Now the interval that we're interested in is the interval from 0 to 1. Notice that from 0 to 1 on the closed interval, I'm not continuous. I had to pick up my pencil. And if we try to think about the MVT, 
we would be computing the secant slope between those endpoints, which we can see is 1, but we can also see that the tangent slope on the entire interior interval is going to be 0. So we will never get a tangent slope that equals 1, which was the secant slope. And the reason the MVT does not apply is because f of x is not continuous on that closed interval. With example 3, we now actually want to find the value of C that satisfies the MVT for each of these. So in order to do that, we need to set up an equation that says the secant slope equals the tangent slope, because that is what the conclusion of the MVT tells us. So the secant slope will be F of B minus F of A over that b minus the a, whereas the tangent slope at c will be the derivative of this with a c plugged in. So that would be a 2 thirds times a c to the negative 1 third. If we rewrite this using 1 plugged in and 0 plugged in, I will get a 1 minus 0 over a 1 minus 0, which is 1, and we need that to equal this 2 over 3 times the cube root of c. If I cross multiply now, I will get 3 times the cube root of c equals 2, and if I isolate c, I will divide by 3, and then I will cube both sides. That will give me an 8 over 27. The final thing that I will do is I will verify that that 8 27 is in between 0 and 1, which it is, and I'm done. If I look at part b, I want the sine inverses secant slope to be the same as the tangent slope. So here at f of x, I will write secant slope equals tangent slope. I will write f of b minus f of a over b minus a has to equal the derivative of this with a c plugged in. So we recall that our derivative of sine inverse is 1 over the square root of 1 minus whatever's inside squared, and we're plugging a c in. If I continue this, f of 1 says what is the angle whose sine is 1? And the answer to that question is pi over 2. Then we're going to subtract the angle whose sine is negative 1, and that's a negative pi over 2. And on the bottom, I have a 1 minus a negative 1, which is a 2. I need that to equal a 1 over a square root of 1 minus c squared. If I continue, I will get a pi over 2 plus another pi over 2 gives me a pi, and then I'm dividing that result by 2. In order to now isolate the c, I'm going to cross multiply. So I'll get a pi times a 1 minus c squared has to equal a 2. Then I'll divide by pi. Then I'll square both sides. Then I will subtract 1, change the sign, and then take the square root. So that'll give me a c equals a 1 minus a 4 over pi squared square root plus or minus since I'm the one that introduces the root. So now we've got to double check that this shows up in the open interval. Well 4 over pi squared is a number smaller than 1 and I'm taking a 1 minus something smaller than 1 which means I will end up being smaller than 1 inside, but larger than 0, and then I'm going to take the square root. So that output of this entire expression will end up being a number smaller than 1 and larger than negative 1. So both of these will work, and we have found our c's. With example 4, we want to write the equation for the secant line and for the tangent line that is parallel to it on this function on the interval from 1 to 3. So that means we're going to be writing the equation for two lines, a secant line and a tangent line. With the secant line, we will need a point and we will need a slope. With the tangent line, we will also need a point and a slope. For the secant line, we can either use the point that goes with 1 
or we can use the point that goes with 3, our choice. So if I plug in 1 into the function, I get a 0. And if I plug in 3, I get a square root of 2. Personally, I think this point will be easier to work with. The slope for the secant line will be f of b, which is 3, minus f of a, which is 1, over b minus a. That will give us a root 2 minus a 0 over a 3 minus 1, which is a root 2 over a 2. Notice I now have a point and I have a slope and I can write the equation of the secant line, which will be y equals the slope times x minus the x-coordinate plus the y-coordinate. In order to write the tangent line, I'm going to need a point and a slope so that I can write that line. And what I know is that the secant line and the tangent line are parallel, so that means the slope is going to be the same for both lines. So the interesting piece is we've now got to figure out what the point is for that tangent line. In order to do that, we're going to take the derivative of this, which is 1 half times x minus 1 to the negative 1 half times 1. Notice this is my tangent slope, and I'm going to set that equal to the secant slope. So here's that mean value theorem coming into play, because this function is continuous on the closed interval, and it's differentiable on the open interval. I'm going to have a problem at 1, but 1 is not in the open interval. So we satisfy the conditions of the mean value theorem, which means we should be able to solve this for a c somewhere in the interval from 1 to 3. If I multiply this out, I'll get a 1 over 2 root x minus 1. That needs to equal a root 2 over a 2. If I cross multiply, I will get a 2 equals a 2 times a root 2 times a square root of x minus 1. So if I divide now, I'll have a 1 over a root 2 equals a square root of x minus 1. Square both sides, I'll get a 1 half equals an x minus a 1. I add 1 to both sides and I'll get x equals 3 halves. So I have the x coordinate of my point. I now need the y coordinate. Well, 3 halves minus 1 gives me a 1 half. So the square root of that 1 half is a 1 over a root 2 or a root 2 over 2. Your choice. Now that I have the point and I have the slope, I can write the equation of the line that will be parallel to the secant line. And I'm done. With example 5 now, it says that f prime is between 3 and 5 for all values of x. And we want to show that f of 8 minus f of 2 is between 18 and 30. So this is a very different application of that mean value theorem. Because f prime of x is between 3 and 5 for all values, that means f prime of x is never undefined. So because of that, f is differentiable everywhere. Because it's differentiable, it must also be continuous. And because it satisfies both of those conditions, that means the MVT applies. So what that'll mean for us next is that f of 8 minus f of 2 over 8 minus 2, notice I've set up a secant slope on the interval from 2 to 8, which is within these real domains that must equal f prime somewhere. But I told you that f prime is trapped between 3 and 5. So that means this expression, f of 8 minus f of 2 over 8 minus 2, must also be trapped between 3 and 5. Well, notice that 8 minus 2 is the same as 6. And if I multiply the entire inequality by 6, I'm going to get 18 is less than or equal to f of 8 minus f of 2 less than or equal to 30. And that's what I was trying to prove. I'd like you now to look at your notes web exam problems and see which ones you know how to do already and which ones you're going to need some extra assistance with. And then I'd like you to think about what that mean value theorem means so that you can write it in your own words.